Welcome to the Jungle Diaries, brought to you by the Salon Press from the Flame Tree Estate and Hotel. This pocket-sized plantation, no more than 25 acres of spices, trees and forest, hides deep in the jungle country north of Kandy, Sri Lanka's last kingdom. This is where you'll find me, shedding the norms of Notting Hill and Oxford, of cafes, corporations, caviar to plant trees, to breed goats and schnauzers, to crop pepper, run a boutique hotel, and document this small, well-kept secret of an island. Monday the 15th of May, 2003, Le Petit Mort. The French condition, Le Petit Mort, hung in my head as I woke up this morning, for there was a moment, as there is almost every day, when, upon waking, I could so easily fling myself back into sleep. Just like Gandhi, every night when I go to sleep, I die. The room is dark and cool, perfume faintly of lavender. The bedsheets are soft. The world is barely waking, this being five, or at best, 5.15 in the morning. But Bertie, Bertie is doing his poor thing, extending it to my nose, a greeting made with all the polite hesitancy of an Oxford philosophy delegate at his first international conference. But hesitant or not, it is never withdrawn. Bertie may be polite, but he is also determined. The poor will gently tap my, f my nose if not first seized. And this then morphs into a all clear, stations go. He and Archibald begin an enthusiastic tumble. Bianca waddles up through the duvet, and Coco lifts her silky, sleepy head from the adjacent pillow and yawns. The girls, I note, are far more languid in their first movements than the boys. Do bitches feel le petit mort more than males? But I am now nearing the point of maximum danger and greatest decision. I unbolt the doors, and the dogs tumble out onto the lawns and run around palms, mango and clove trees. Archie begins the first of two to three circuits around the fences to ensure we have not succumbed to overnight attacks from wild elephants, armed dacoits, homeless monkeys or feral peacocks. I return to the bedroom. It is still dark, cool and perfumed. I can feel that rapturous tug of sleep winching my head and heart towards the bed again. It is as inexorable as an AA rescue lorry, winching up one of my suddenly dead cars off the M4 and onto its back. Quite wry, the French reserve, the little death, to post-coital siestas, seems very mysterious and not a little mean from a rationing point of view. I'm English. I don't need sex. I can feel la petit mort simply upon weak waking, and if I succumb now, I'll be out for at least two more hours. So I do the only thing possible when waging a defensive campaign driven by thoughts of victory. I open the large sliding doors to let the jungle air in and the view of wave upon wave of green mountains, hills and valleys. There it is, the jungle, fixed as the call to prayer but ever-changing. I turn off the air conditioners, put on the fans, pull off the duvet and switch on the arches. After this, there can be no retreat. It's like burning the boats. As village politics erupts at Radio 4's home farm and the bull around the composition of the cricket team and Tracy Horribin's hen party, the dogs return one by one from their brief outing, curl up and join me listening to the soap opera. By ten to six, it's all over bar the next step. The day, like a blini now merely waiting for a dollop of caviar and creme fraiche, is ready to begin. But this jungle waking for all its dangerous rip cords and underwater currents, is a relatively easy challenge. Waking up in London at 10 to 6 when I have a normal job and the virtuous inclination to swim 50 lengths in the gym before the office, that was much harder. The water was always too cold. The other gym goes demotivatingly assembled as an order of silent monks hours before the dissolution of the monasteries. Sleepy, cross, awkward. The surge of city traffic noises rises like trenchant humidity. 
the office itself is waiting like a vortex, or the chamber of a demanding mistress displeased with the roses just delivered. School was a little better. The windows opened whether it was minus ten or plus ten outside. Thirty other boys in the long dormitory caught in the institutional tentacles of a school schedule that drove us from classroom to classroom, playing field to canteen. There, Le Petit Moore was presidentially present, but kept hard at bay by howling prefects and unyielding teachers in Harris Tweed. Memoirs of the petty ball follow me through the day like naughty angels. But by 7am they are all busted flushes. They have no chance of cutting through the dogged determination to keep buggering on. All across the estate, people are now busy. Sweeping leaves, brushing terrazzo, feeding goats, making cinnamon buns, laying tables, netting the odd petal of pink frangipani off the pool. Early tuk-tuks come and go, collecting people, depositing fresh tuna. In the frangipani trees outside my office, square-tailed bulbuls with red beaks are building a nest. Never has Barrion been so better able to overcome the English version of La Petit Moor.